So today, what we're going to do is um, move us further into the Z transform land, and we're going to skip over a few of the typical things that we would normally do with a new transform. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time deriving the transforms themselves. You can read about, we did a couple last time, you can read about that in the textbook. Um, so we, we showed a few of those last time, and there's common ones that are available to us in lookup tables, uh, all the common signals that we would tend to use for solving problems. And um, so we're not going to dwell on those. And I'll look them up. And again, that's going to be our preferred method for, for actually performing a C transform, is we'd rather look it up and answer in the table than deriving it. We do have a defining equation. Could be if we had to. <coughs> but better to just look up the answer because we're trying to come up with a shortcut method for doing some of the computation work with the system analysis that work. And so we want to make that as easy as possible. We will also be helped in that by if we understand the properties of the Z transform so we know what happens if we take one of those table entries and modify it somehow. If we time reverse it or we scale it <coughs> or multiply it by 10, and that's what the transform table tells us. And again, we could spend several class sessions deriving all these, proving all these. But you've done this with Laplace, you've done it with several flavors of the Fourier transform, both continuous and discrete. So I'm going to just throw them up here, talk about what's unique about them with the Z transform, and then let's just practice them in homework and read some examples in the textbook. So we can get on to some of the applications because that's really what we came here for. We want to see how to use these things, how to put them to work. And as we use them and run through examples, we'll run into some places where we use these properties as well. So we'll get some practice that way. <coughs> so the, this is on the old set of notes. Um, so we're just finishing up the last few slides there. And the way this table set up again is we have a property, we have a assumed signal that starts off as an x of n, our time signal, and in these tables we assume the z transform for x of n is a thing called x of z, and then see what happens if we modify that signal somehow. Let's see what effect that has on the transform. Now, but now that we're in the z transform and not the DTFT, we've got one more piece of information we need to talk about, and that's how, how do these transformations of, uh, ways that we're changing our signal, how does that affect the region of convergence after that we apply that that uh, property? And so we'll we'll talk about that as well. Right. So the first and simplest thing we can do is take a signal and shift it in time, either delay it, x of n minus capital N, or advance it, x of n plus capital N. In the ETFT, we end up multiplying something by e to the minus j two pi f. Here we're going to multiply our transform by z to the minus n. So again, we recognize that's the operator we're going to be using for delays in our in the z transform. And if, if your region of convergence for your original function x of n was some ROC, we'll call that the region of convergence of x, after you do this time shift, well, you're still going to have the same region of convergence. The only thing that might happen is perhaps you may lose uh, z equals zero or z equals infinity as one possibility depending on how you shifted it and whether you made it non-causal <coughs> or uh, you really cross that, that answer point. So that's the zero boundary or not. If I take a time signal and I reverse it in time, so that's like replacing the index n with minus n, <coughs> minus n. we take a transform x of z and everywhere there's z in the transform, we replace it with the reciprocal 1 over z. And likewise, the region of convergence flips. We get the reciprocal of it. So if its boundaries were, let's just say they were from radius 2 to 3, they become radius 1 third to 1 half. So we, we do work the, the radial limits of the region of convergence when we do that reflection. And if we take a signal and make its anti-causal version, which is the same thing, except we're going to leave out the 
the n equals zero value, <coughs> well, as I would expect, I'll get something that looks very similar, except in this case, if I leave off that n equals zero value from the sine function, I that subtract, subtract off, transform from the, from the um, transform domain, and since I have a unit sample in the time domain, its transform is a constant, so we just get the scaling of the constant x zero from across here. Scaling by alpha to the n, meaning if I take some x of n and multiply it by an exponential, we take its x of z and replace z with z over alpha. So we're multiplying here, we're dividing in the transform domain. And that's going to scale the region of convergence these as boundaries by the magnitude of alpha. If I take a time function and multiply it by n, which seems like a dangerous thing to do, but if I do that, what does it do to the transform? So I'll take the transform, take its derivative with respect to z, and multiply that by minus z. And again, you know, affect the region of convergence, so that we maybe lose z equals zero or z equals infinity. And then the last two, well, second to last two properties are a little interesting. <coughs> These are what we <coughs> call the modulation properties back in continuous time. We take a time function and multiply it by a cosine, or a time function multiply it by a sine. What happens? Well, what happened back in the continuous time domain? We had some function with some um, lovely spectrum. Uh, well, even the Fourier domain, right? And some function, and we, we multiply it by a cosine or a sine. What happened to that function? What was that modulation property? What's the Fourier transform of a cosine? Two impulses. So when we multiply things in the time domain, we can evolve them in the frequency domain. So we would get copies of that spectrum, half the size on each side, and make copies where those impulses were. So we would shift them around. Now this looks kind of similar. We take x of z and replace it with x of something else, z or j omega one half and one going one plus j, one going minus j, that seems kind of like the same thing, except I'm multiplying z by either the j omega, the j omega. What's that doing? If z is already a complex value, and multiply by either the j omega, what part of the complex thing am I changing? In the phase, yeah. So using the phase angle, um, in terms of looking at in the way we look at z in the as a real imaginary rectangular coordinates, that's kind of like rotating it, moving it around the rotating it around the origin. That's kind of a weird thing. So it's. It'll make more sense on Monday when we connect the Z transform to the frequency response, but be aware it's kind of, kind of the same thing, but a little weird. The most important property is the one we really want to use, the convolution property. And yes, it turns out the Z transforms, just like convolution in the time domain, for time functions, um, when we transform those functions and transform that operation, it becomes multiplication of their z transforms. Now, if x of z has, would have its own region of convergence, h of z would generally have its own region of convergence. The product of them is going to have a region of convergence that's the intersection of those two. And so, so it could possibly be a smaller set of values that are included in the region of convergence once we do the convolution. Okay. Again, we could spend all day deriving these, proving these, Let's just put them to use when we talk about some applications. But are there any questions about them and their implications in that basic chart? 
No, it's Friday. We're not going to ask questions about that stuff. Okay. Let's go talk about some applications. That's more fun. All right. So, all the same language that you learned in the E228, it's back. We're going to talk about the same kinds of things we talked about when we were talking with FOSS transforms. We're going to talk about transfer functions. We're going to talk about poles and zeros. We're going to try to relate transfer functions to frequency response. We're going to try to relate poles and zeros to, to the shapes of the frequency response and learn how we can infer and tell just by looking at poles and zeros what kind of system we have, just low pass, high pass, band pass, all that stuff. Everything we could do with poles and zeros back in the 228 days, oh yeah, we could tell whether the system is stable or not. We could tell a lot about the system from the poles and zeros and the transfer function. We're going to do all that again, except for in this Z domain instead of the S plane. And things are circular, not straight in this domain. So uh, starting with the thing we call the transfer function, if we take the Z transform of the unit sample response, that gives us our capital H of Z. That's our system function. That's our transfer function. That's a relationship of the output to the input, but not of the time domain signals, but of the Z transforms. So H of Z is the reciprocal, uh, or is the, 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 uh, the uh, division of Y of Z Z transform of the output signal divided by X of Z and Z transform of the input signal. What we call a transfer function. You can think of it like a complex scheme. <clears throat> and if I need that, which we will, I can always get it from the unit sample response because it literally is the Z transform of H of N. So for the table look up with my properties or by the equation, by whatever method, you give me H of N, I can find H of Z. Now, <coughs> finding H of N is no fun, so we're going to want to do it more simply. And the same tricks that we played with discrete time Fourier transforms are going to be available to us here. You give me a diagram, block diagram, you give me a difference equation, and I can extract the transfer function really easily by taking the original difference equation and now Z transforming it term by term. So take every one of these terms. Z transform them because Z transforms is a linear operation. We can add them up. So if I transform Y of n becomes Y of Z. Minus alpha Y of n minus one becomes minus alpha well, Y of Z with a delay. And what delay is by one is a multiply by Z to minus one. And in this side X of n becomes X of Z. And if I had any delay versions over here, I'd do the same thing. I'd minus one, do minus two terms, whatever. And then we can factor out all the y's and z's on the left side, all the x and z's on the right side, and then form the, the uh, quotient of those two, y of z over x of z, and take their equivalent parts to be one minus one minus alpha z minus one. <coughs> this is exactly what we did a couple days ago with DTFTs, and if you did the homework you turned in, we can we, before we were transforming the difference equation and deriving H of F, now we're derived uh, transforming the difference equation using the Z transform and deriving H of Z in a simpler, out uh, same kind of simple algebraic way, and yet much more compact. I'm not writing E to the minus J, 2 pi F this, 4 pi F that, just the Z. So nice, a little cleaner. Okay, but it is the same process that we were doing before. Yeah. You transform the difference equation, rearranging it, make y of z over x of z, and voila, out is h of z, the transfer function. Okay. And again, since you can write any linear constant coefficient difference equation has the same basic form, and if I have a linear time drain system, it has to be described by linear constant coefficient difference equation. However many y terms I need on one side, however many x terms I need on the other side, y of n is normalized to have a mean coefficient of 1. All the other coefficients are a1, a2, a3, v coefficients with the x terms. And then if we transform this generalized equation, well, all these come across as y of z's and y of z's with delays, 
multiplied by the A coefficients. These all come over as X of Z's and X of Z's multiplied by delays with the B coefficients. Factor out the Y's on the one side and the X's on the other. Rearrange them for H of Z. And you will always have a transfer function, a system function, H of Z, that has this form. It has the difference equation coefficients and the numerator, <coughs> uh, the uh, X coefficients, the B coefficients and the numerator, A coefficients and the denominator, ascending powers of Z for both, and that's it. It's always going to be that form. And if I don't like negative powers of Z, well, I'll just find whatever the highest power of Z is on each and multiply top and bottom by the same Z to that exponent, and I can have positive powers of Z. So we have two polynomials in Z, one in the numerator, one in the denominator. If they're expressed this way with negative um, exponents, the high, most negative exponent is the degree of the numerator, that's M. The most negative exponent in the denominator is capital N, the degree of the denominator, which is also the system order. So this would be an N capital N order system. Now, just like back in 228 days, if you've got a polynomial, we're going to want to factor it. We're going to want to factor both the numerator and the denominator into a bunch of terms. And if I do that, mm -hmm. I'll call the roots of the numerator polynomials, these terms here, z1, z2, and however many I have, we'll call those the zeros of h of z. And we call them that because if I <coughs> replace z with one of those values, with either z1 or z2, we put z1 in there, and we get a zero in the numerator, we get a non-zero value in the denominator, and h of z must go to zero at that that um, particular value of z, that's the clever name. And if we take all the denominator factors, p1, p2, all those roots of the denominator, we're going to, well, we plug in z equals p1 or z equals p2 in here, we're going to get a zero in the denominator and a, some non-zero value in the numerator, so h of z is going to want to go off to infinity, right? And we call those poles, and they're pushing it off to infinity. Same terminology we use for H of S transfer functions in the Laplace series, right? <coughs> so here's an example. Here's an H of Z we derive from a difference equation, perhaps. And we've got a quadratic in the numerator, quadratic in the denominator. We factor that out. Well, this is Z squared equals minus 1, so Z must be plus or minus J. Here I've got a common factor of z I can pull out, so I can simply factor the denominator z over z minus one half. So this one has two poles, two zeros. Zero is a plus or minus j, poles at zero and then plus one half. And notice I usually write our h of z in the form z minus a pole term or a, a uh, zero term. Okay. Now, remember pole zero diagrams? They're back. Except now we're not plotting poles and zeros as functions of s with sigmas and j omegas. We're plotting poles and zeros as values of the complex variable z. So we plot them on a complex plane where the horizontal axis is the real part of z, and the uh, vertical axis is the imaginary part of z. And we keep track of this thing we call the unit circle. And so, let's see. That that particular one we had zeros at plus and minus j. So we go on the imaginary axis, all the way up to one times j, and down to minus one times j. And as before, we denote zeros with a circle. And if I have more than one zero that are duplicates of each other, I'll put a number next to it for how many are sitting on top of each other right there. And for poles, we'll designate those with x's. We have a pole at plus one half, and we have a pole at zero. And so this would be the poles <coughs> diagram for that, that transfer function, that system function we had on the previous page. Right. Just like we were doing then back in 
to 28 days. Hmm. Hmm. If I didn't tell you, if I erased that unit circle, and I didn't tell you this was the z point, if I lied to you and told you this is a transfer function, the S domain system function, could you tell me anything about that system? Could you tell me anything good or bad about it? What's that? Has a positive real pole. Okay, so what's so what's wrong with that? Uh, I don't like it. You don't like it. Why don't you like it? Because you can't plug in real values. You can't plug like in positive, real values. Can't plug in positive. Uh, I don't like this positive real pole. Why is that? What does that do to my system? Oh, Makes it unstable. If it's a causal system, and I have a pole on the called the right half plane. It was unstable. Turns out, this one, this pole zero diagram we have here for our discrete time system, that, that guy's okay. That particular pole on the positive real axis is actually all right. So things are a little different here. Again, we're gonna do all the same things we did in, with H of S's in the S plane, and pole zero, poles and zeros of S uh, in the S domain. But the rules change a little bit but we'll still be able to do all the same things. Like, we'll be able to tell, is the system stable or not? Is the system causal or not? Um, does the system have a peak in the magnitude response somewhere? What's its DC gain? Um, what else? Mostly stability, though. That's a big thing we can get from this. So that's what we're going to be working on today, trying to get to get some rules for how we can make use of this pole zero diagram. But I would contend, if I give you that and one more piece of information, you should be able to tell me the frequency response. <coughs> you should be able to tell me the difference equation for the system and a little, whether it's stable or not, and a little bit about it, about the shape of this frequency response. Yeah, so with this, we can, um actually get the original H of Z just knowing this? Just knowing this. Okay. Yep, and we're going to do that. <clears throat> now, where is H of Z in this diagram? I see Z values, but I want to know something about the transfer function H of Z. It, I can't draw that in this point, right? This is just all the possible values of Z. These are the numbers I could plug into H of Z to get a complex value that has a magnitude of days. So if I was trying to plot H of Z, I'm, I'm not here. I'm in another plane or another axis. I gotta have an axis coming out of the board and plot either the real part of it versus Z or the magnitude of it versus Z or maybe the phase of it versus Z. <coughs> so H of Z, whatever aspect of it I wanna look at is gonna be a, a surface contour in the third dimension here, right? And the shape of that contour is going to be dictated by those pole zero locations. And we're going to particularly look at the magnitude of H of Z versus Z as a contour. For this particular one, it would look like this. Thanks to MATLAB, we can actually plot that function. What can you tell me, looking at that, of how the sh magnitude of H of Z is affected by the poles and zeros? Yeah. What happens at the zeros? Zero. So we take this contour, and anywhere there's a zero, the contour gets pulled right down to Z equals zero. I've got a zero here at minus J, here's the imaginary axis minus j and plus j, we've got two zeros that pull in the contour down to there. Now we can't really tell from here, but these poles, what's the value of the magnitude of h of z at these values of z? What happens to it? It goes to infinity. So then they're like pushing the contour way up beyond where we can even see. So the 
the value of the transfer function at any any position, any value of z, is going to be dictated by exactly by these pulses and zeros <coughs> and where we are, how far away from them we're operating, you know, where we're looking. Okay. So we can think of the h of magnitude <coughs> h of z like a rubber sheet. You may have done this back in 228. <coughs> you, know, you hire the trolls, you have them grab the rubber sheet, have them run off from infinity. If you have the same number of poles as you have zeros, have them hold it up at one at infinity. And then everywhere there's a zero, you tack down the rubber sheet right to the z plane. Those were at all the roots of the numerator polynomial. And at all the pole locations, you get an infinitely long tent pole and push up the rubber sheet to infinity at those positions and let it fall where it will. So at the zeros, we push ourselves down. And at the poles, we push up the, the sheet to infinity. Hold it, if we have the same number of poles as we have zeros, hold it at the value of one at infinity. So that's kind of where it wants to taper two at the end. And then let it go where it needs to. And then if I want to know what's the magnitude of the function, well, so if I want to know what is the magnitude of h of z at z equals plus 1, well, I can plug in z equals plus 1 in my h of z formula and find it. Or we can go to z equals plus 1 and see how high the sheet is there and measure that. Okay. Monday, we're going to connect this rubber sheet to the frequency response. But for today, let's just look <coughs> at what we're looking at here. There's a really complicated H of Z. It has one, two, three, four uh, zeros and one, two, three, four poles. And from this, we want to see how, how would you plot its pole zero diagram and how would we work our way back to the difference equation from the pole zero diagram. So we had this H of Z and said, give me the pole zero diagram. OK. I've got two zeros at Z equals 0. And again, notice I'll put a zero, a circle where the zeros are located. And if I have two of them, I'll put a two next to it. Here I get a zero at z equals plus j1. Here I get one at z equals minus j1. So in each of those places, I'll put zeros as well. In the denominator, we have z equals plus one half for one pole, so x there. Z equals minus three quarters of pole there, and a complex conjugate pair one at z equals minus one plus or minus one one half to be in there. So easy to go from h of z once I factor it, I can go to the pole zero diagram. We're gonna to want to go backwards though. We're gonna to want to be able to recover this from that. Um, now, regions of convergence and stability. Hmm. Do you think that if h of z goes to infinity at the values of z that we call the poles, can those values of z be inside the region of convergence for h of z? No. Infinity is not a converging value. Right? So right off the bat, we can conclude those particular values of z must not be in the region of convergence for h of z, the function, the transform this function. How about zeros? Are they going to be allowed in the region of convergence? Mm -hmm. They're OK. So the zeros can be anywhere. Poles can't be in the region of convergence for the function. Okay. Now. Let's start putting some pieces together here. Last time, we said the shape of the region of convergence depends on what flavor of time function you have, what direction your time function goes. If you have a right-sided function that's infinitely long, like a causal function would be, the region of convergence had a particular shape. Right? It had a shape that had some minimum radius and went outwards. <clears throat> if you give me a system and draw the poles and zeros <coughs> in the system, 
if I know the system is a causal system, meaning it has a causal unit sample response, I know it has this shape or region of convergence. I also know to be stable, it's not allowed, well, well just period, I'm not allowed to have any of those holes inside <coughs> the region of convergence. And so, the region of convergence can't include pole A, can't include pole B, it can only include pole C because it would, if it included pole A, it would be going outward from there and we would try to encompass those other two. So if I have a causal system, I know the region of convergence starts at the outermost pole, the largest magnitude pole. So easy way to find regions of convergence. As a causal system, causal function, we find that highest radius pole doesn't have to be in the real axis, doesn't have to be in the magic, could be complex, could be anywhere. Whatever has the biggest radius, that's going to define the inner radius, the inner edge of the region of convergence. And the region of convergence doesn't include that radius. It can't allow that just beyond that pole. It doesn't include dead points just after. We said if we had a left-sided function, it had the opposite shape of region of convergence. It had some minimum <coughs> radius and went inward. If my region of convergence can't include poles, that means if I have an anti-causal system, its region of convergence must start at the innermost pole, or the smallest radius pole, and go in. So we know that's going to dictate the region, of, the location of the region of convergence for that kind. And if we have a two-sided infinite sequence, its transform would have, well, we said it had a donut shape that had to be pinched between some two, well, now we know it has to be pinched between some two pairs of poles. <coughs> it cannot be encompassed by A and C because that would include B. Not allowed to do it. So it's either this one or this one. And right now, I can't tell you which one, but in a minute, we will. All right, so the shape of the region of convergence depends on whether I have causal or right side or left side functions. I'm particular they're infinite. And the region of convergence cannot include any poles, so it's either the outermost pole that defines the edge for a causal system or the innermost for an anti causal. Now let's talk stability. What was my requirement again for? S domain, all my poles. This was a J omega axis. This was a sigma axis. Where, where were my poles allowed in this world? Bam over here. Yeah. Bam over here. Yeah. Bam on the real axis. Yeah. Bam over here. No. Can I have them um, on the J omega axis? Uh, only if I wanted to make an oscillator. But I definitely couldn't have them over here. So, mm, so I wasn't allowed, we needed to keep all of our poles here. We weren't allowed to have them in the right half plane. Well, what about in our discrete time? Well, we already have a criteria <coughs> for stability based on the difference equation, right? If the roots of the characteristic equation were less than one, then we had a stable system if it was causal. Well, <clears throat> remember what that characteristic equation was? We took our difference equation and we took the left half, the left hand side with all the y terms, and we replaced these delays with z's, z's, and then found the roots of these z polynomials. Uh, like we said, we couldn't say it at the time, but we were actually taking the z-transform of the right side of the equation. And this polynomial of z, where, where is that in h of z? Where does that live? Denominator. This polynomial of z ends up in the denominator of h of z, and so the roots of the characteristic equation is just another name for the poles of h of z. So if the roots of the characteristic equation have to have magnitudes less than 1 for a 
causal system to be stable, it must also be true that the poles of that transfer function, which are the same thing <coughs> for a causal system, must have magnitudes less than one. in my Z plane now, the real imaginary part, I can have poles over here if I want, either side of the axis, but they have to have magnitudes less than one. Or, another way of saying that is, they have to be inside the unit circle. Because finding the roots of the characteristic equation is exactly the same thing as finding the poles of H of Z, they are the same thing. Our stability criterion that was the magnitude of the roots of the characteristic equation have to be one. Could also be written the poles of H of Z have to have magnitudes less than one. Or another way to say the exact same thing is for a causal system, all the poles have to lie inside the unit circle. If it's causal. You have a stable system. So, again, we can use a pole zero diagram to tell us whether the system's stable or not. If you tell me it's causal, I'll tell you, I'll look at the poles, see if they're inside the unit circle. If they are, we're okay. If they're not, and I have a causal system, I don't have a stable system. Zeros can go anywhere. I can have zeros inside the unit circle, outside the unit circle. I can have zeros any other place I want. No problem. Poles. Poles matter. Everybody see the connection? The poles? If I say the word poles, that's the same thing as saying roots of the characteristic equation. Same thing as saying roots of the denominator of each of them. It's all the same thing. Now, here's where we put all the pieces together. Regions of convergence, stability, pole locations, it's all coupled. If I have a causal right-sided system, its region of convergence goes from the outermost pole outwards. If the system is stable, that pole must be inside the unit circle. Ergo, <coughs> to it, if I have a causal system, I can tell it's stable if the region of convergence includes the unit circle. Okay. The innermost pole's got to be inside, the region of convergence goes out from there. If the region of convergence includes the unit circle, I have a stable system. It also works yeah, on the other kinds of systems too. The anti-causal system, the outer, excuse me, the innermost pole defines the edge of the region of convergence, goes inward, if I have a stable system, a stable anti-causal or left-sided system, it turns out all the poles have to be outside the unit circle so that the region of convergence still includes the unit circle. And two-sided systems, well, it's gotta be between two poles and two poles better be the ones that bridge, that include the unit circle to have a stable system as well. And probably nobody told you that, but we had the same criterion back in H of S days. The smallest pole defined the edge of the region of convergence, <coughs> and the region of convergence had to include the J omega axis for a stable system. We had the same criterion there that we have here. Just the thing that was the geomega axis there is the unit circle here. So the general, the most general stability part criterion that we could say that works for all kinds of systems is the region of convergence, so the transfer function, must include the unit circle. Works for causal, anti-causal, two-sided, doesn't matter. Now, we are gonna pretty much limit ourselves to causal systems you have a causal unit sample response, and we're putting causal signals in, so this is really the only one we're going to use much at all. 
be aware that the rules change for other kinds of systems. But we're going to live over here. So I'll probably start just saying, you know, the check for stability is all poles inside the unit circuit for the assuming causal. And then we know that the region convergence will include the unit circuit. Okay. A lot to digest and put together there. Are we doing all right? Any part of that not making, not making sense? Let's see how it connects. All right, we're doing good. <coughs> so in addition to all the ways we had to describe systems before, we've got a new way, the pole zero diagram. And from that, I can recover H of Z. I can get the frequency response. And I can move anywhere else around here I need to. So let's do that. <coughs> So, if we wanted to work the process backward, and I give you a pole zero diagram, I've got to give you a pole zero diagram and one more piece of information. Something to determine whether there's some overall scale or gain factor in the system. And so, if I give you poles and zeros, you can reconstruct H of Z from a generic form put an unknown scale factor out in front and just literally plug in the values of the poles and the values of the zeros to recover H of Z and use that one piece of information to determine the unknown K. So here, for example, we could work backwards, take our two, two zeros at C equals zero, say, oh, we've got two zeros in the numerator, I've got more zeros at plus or minus J, create <coughs> their zero terms, create a term for each of the poles in the denominator, and then work it through the polynomial multiplication, and you can have the H of Z with positive exponents, and if you prefer the negative ones, which if we're going to difference equations we would need, we find the highest power of Z, which is Z to the fourth, multiply by the reciprocal of that, top over both, Z to the minus four over Z to the minus four, and get the negative version. And again, I got to tell you one piece of information to solve for k. If I don't, you got to carry it along as an unknown coefficient, uh, an unknown SVD scale factor. And then we can, again, recognize h of z is y of z over x of z, cross multiply, then multiply in the y's of z times all these terms, x of z times all these terms, inverse transform term by term, and get back the difference equation. <coughs> It's a little bit too fine print, a little bit too big. So let's do a simpler example of that question first. Um, so finding uh, y of z and x of z, is that purely by just looking at the numerator and denominator of the h of z that you found? No. So how does it process? Like, how do you get from the h of z to the y of z over x of z? So as we did with ETFTs, I'm, in this case, I'm using my poles and zeros to reconstruct this ratio, yeah, which is H of Z, yeah. which is by definition Y of Z over X of Z. Mm -hmm. And so that's as much as I can infer. I can, from that, recover the difference equation, but I can't yet tell you what is Y of Z for a particular okay. X of Z, but I can use this to do that. Okay. And that's when we get the system analysis next week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Before we leave this complicated example, though, uh, if you look at this difference equation, is that a causal difference equation? It's okay. Causal. Therefore, and where is the region of convergence of this system? Outside of which color poles? Outside of which color? Which color poles are going to define the edge of the region convergence? Red. Red. So region convergence goes like that. Is that a stable system? No, they're outside the unit circle. The region convergence doesn't include the unit circle. So this would be an unstable system because those poles, because it's causal and those poles are outside. All right, let's take a simpler example. <clears throat> here's a pole zero diagram. Okay, here you go. Here's the system, and I'll give you one piece of information. The frequency, the DC response, the fre at 
the discrete time Fourier transform evaluated at f equals zero has a value of four. From that, I can recover the uh, difference equation. How do we do that? Well, again, start with a generic prototype for your h of z. I've got two zeros, two poles. So we set up two zero terms, two pole <coughs> terms, and an unknown scale factor. Then plug in the actual pole term, the actual poles and zeros. Notice I use negative signs in here in these terms. So I can <coughs> plug in directly the values of the function of the poles and zeros. That's minus k, zero, plus one half. Then multiply the numerator terms and the denominator terms. Now, if I've got this far and you've given me a piece of information, like h of z or h of f at some value, I haven't proven it while we talked about it last time. For the moment, take my word for it, and I'll prove it to you again on Monday, that the DC response of the system, the equivalent of the DTFT at frequency zero, is the transfer function at z equals plus one. So my information that I'm giving you is that h of z evaluated at z equals one has a magnitude, has a value of four. So I'll take this function, replace z, all the z's with one, and say that equals four, and I'll <coughs> simplify down and say, oh, 4k equals four, so in this case, contrived example, k equals one. If I know that, then if I want to find the difference equation, I need negative exponents <coughs> like this. So I'll find the biggest positive exponent that I have in the numerator and denominator, multiply both by the opposite, the negative of that, and get a leading one form of the h of z. Then <coughs> remember h of z is y of z over x of z, so we can now cross multiply these terms. So we get y of z times the denominator equals x of z times the numerator. Then distribute through the y's of z's and x of z's. And now take this and inversely transform using the delay property. The y of z becomes y of n minus 1 half z to minus 1. y of z becomes the minus 1 half the y of n to the power of 1. x of z comes down here. And z to the minus 2 transforms times x of z transform to x of n minus 2 and that minus 2. And that's the difference equation. So again, start with pole zeros, you can get back to h of z, you can get back to difference equation, and the other way too, from the difference equation directly to poles and zeros, or to h of z and poles and zeros. How are we going to use this? <coughs> well, if you need to find the unit sample response of the system, Transform the difference equation, find h of z, and inverse transform it. That's probably going to be the easiest way. If you want to do system analysis, here's the answer to your question. We'll find h of z, and then again take convolution and put it in the frequency domain where it becomes multiplication. We know h of z, give me an input signal, I'll find its transform, I'll multiply those, and I'll find the transform of the output, but to get the answer I really want, I need to inverse transform that. So we haven't talked about how to do that yet. And we did a simple example in DTFTs. We're going to need to do that with engines here. So next week, we'll take up system analysis. The first, on Monday, we'll look at how we connect frequency response to H of Z, how we do steady state analysis, and then we move to inverse transforms in general system analysis. Have a good weekend.